Welcome back to Hello Nigeria. And uh, yes, today is Democracy Day. Yesterday was, but today has been declared a public holiday by the federal government. It's been 365 days since the APC administration. There's been knocks, there's been kudos, and uh, others are indifferent. Uh, we have a special guest in the studio to help us with uh, review and uh, analysis of President Muhammad Buhari's 365 days in office is a public affairs analyst. His name is Mr. Duke Okuta. It's a pleasure to have you Thank on you Hello Nigeria. Nigeria. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes, uh, Governor Ayodele Fayoshi of Ekiti State has described uh, the 365 days as wasted. Others have said, you know, the president dragged on and it's too slow and the economy is in a state of comatose. Uh, the, uh, and the ruling government itself says, look, things take time. Rome wasn't built in a day. We're working towards it. What's your assessment, general assessment, before we go into the specifics? <laughs> Um, I, I guess, uh, like most Nigerians, uh, I, I would assess the first, Buhari's first year in terms of the impact it has had on me. Mm -hmm. uh, and from that point of view, I guess uh, I would say that I am a little disappointed uh, in the sense that when he came in, he came in with a change mantra, and we haven't seen anything uh, that is specifically change. What we have seen is government as usual. Uh, and when we begin to analyze the in individual aspects, uh, mm. I, especially the three uh, main uh, uh, areas that he made very strong promises about, the economy, security, and agriculture, again, uh, it's very difficult to see where the change has occurred or indeed to see the direction that is going to lead to that change. Is it sufficient to say that I mean, a lot of the journey, a lot of the problems that he has encountered are things that he inherited. And whether or not he stepped into power, we are eventually going to get to where we are today. And that it actually needs, he needs a little more time. They, they also said they weren't prepared for the scale of what they met, uh, the rot. Yes, I mean, that is an argument that, mm -hmm. that politicians are always going to give you. But, uh, I mean, the citizenry are never going to buy. Uh, the reality of the matter is that he went into that campaign being fully aware of where Nigeria was and the trend that was in front of him, what was you know, happening and what was like to happen was obvious to most people. I mean, one of the main areas in, in question is, is oil prices uh, having mm -hmm. fallen you know, up to, at some point, $30 yes. or less. But the reality of the matter is that you know, his advisors, his economic advisors in the party before he came into government would all have been aware of that so trend. Have been the trend was actually all the way uh, from you know, 2013. Mm -hmm. it, 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 at least you know, when it started to really, really dip. I mean, for 2010, Ten. we knew yes. what was going to happen because at that point, the Americans were already moving away from you know oil purchases around the world. They were looking at fracking, and there was every up a chance that Obama was going to eventually allow that to happen. So we still, we still need to look more into this. But first of all, we want to afford people the opportunity to call in. So we're going on a quick break. And when we come back, uh, we would open the phone lines. But first of all, let's reward you with airtime. Welcome back to the show. We're still analyzing President Muhammad Buhari's 365 days in office. And we'll be affording you the opportunity to call in and let us know what your thoughts are. But right here in the studio, we have with us the person of Duke Oputa, and he's here to especially analyze this with us. Thank you for joining us once again. Thank you. Okay, uh, on this show, we'll try, I know time is never a friend here, but we'll try and uh, look at pre uh, critical areas, education, security, and the economy. Let's start with security. Uh, the Boko Haram insurgency seems to have been um, nipped in the bud. We have pockets of violence here and there, but um, the president seems to have done a fantastic job with that. But uh, there are new areas uh, springing up, security challenges, renewed res insurgency in the United Delta, uh, and, uh, of course, the Fulani headsman um, and problem. And, and unfortunately, and his well. speech yesterday, mm -hmm. a lot of people um, criticized the fact that he made no mention of the Fulani headsman in his speech yesterday, but talked about how, before he came into government, 14 um, local government areas in Borno were overtaken by Boko Haram. So what do we really make of this? Well, I mean, first of all, you are correct in saying that he has succeeded in at least regaining territory 
for the, for the country because in truth, you know, some of our territory was occupied by Boko Haram during mm -hmm. the Jonathan era. Uh, but that was simply down to the fact that the army were very ill-equipped and very ill-motivated. And his coming, as you would expect with any new government, it, it didn't matter if it was Buhari or anybody else, any new government that comes in would always motivate people, at least in the first few months, in the first year. And he did precisely that. And being an ex-general as well, I think he understood uh, a, a bit more than Jonathan what, it requ what was required to actually regain our territory. But the Boko Haram menace is not just about territorial you know, uh, occupancy. It's, it's about more than that. It's about insurgency, which they asked to carry now, but not quite as much as it was before. So we can give him a plus in that respect. He has achieved uh, some level of success uh, with Boko Haram in the Northeast, and hopefully he will achieve some more. But as you say, uh, other areas of insecurity have you know, sort of more or less emerged mm. in, in that period. Uh, the IPOP issue, the mm. uh, uh, Hartsman issue, and now the Niger, Niger Delta, Delta Avengers. Avengers. And, and the key element here is, does he have a policy to contain these potentially mm. explosive situations? Again, it's not looking like he has a policy. Or it's, it's not being communicated. If well, one. well, he has communicated. I mean, he said things mm. like, I will deal with them. Anybody who does this, I'll put them in jail, and, and I'll you know, basically yes. deal messlessly with them. And that is not a policy in itself. I mean, that's exact, doing exactly what they are doing. They're going to exactly. deal with us. They're going to deal with them. It's not a policy. Mm. The kind of policy I'm talking about is looking at the, the reasons why these things exist. I mean, give an example. For the agitation. Absolutely. You take the issue of the IPOP, the IPOP issue, and he's put uh, this Mr. Kano, uh, what was his name, in jail. Namdi yeah. uh, In jail. And he's in jail for a, le a, lot of, a, a, a length of time. No trial, no mm. conviction. That is definitely not a policy. If this guy has done something wrong, the, the kind of policy you have is a quick trial and conviction so that everybody who potentially backs him can see what he has done wrong and why he needs it's to be taken out of the system. White. It's yeah. in black and white. But when you incarcerate him without actually bringing him to trial and just leaving there for years, mm -hmm. you actually are fanning the problem. And that's why there is no policy there. The same thing with the Niger Delta. Again, you know, there are issues there. I don't agree with some of the issues personally, but nevertheless, there are issues. They, sit, they talk about uh, ownership of oil, oil fields. They talk about degradation of the environment in the area. They talk about unemployment. And these are areas where he himself has previously recognized to be important creating employment for the youth. If these guys have jobs to go to, they'll be less, you know, more vulnerable to less vulnerable to being recruited by uh, you know, activists who exactly. want to you know, disrupt the, the, the environment. So ultimately, we need to see a security policy. There isn't one in place. Putting the army into, into Niger Delta is not a policy in itself. There needs to be engagement, and more importantly, there needs to be an attempt to, to go to the but, root but, but of the But in problem. fairness to the, Mr. President, uh, the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Mr. Ebe, Dr. Ebe Kachuku, yes. I did say that uh, ammo tanks won't solve the problem of the insurgency uh, in the Niger Delta, of the militancy in the Niger Delta, that they would, and they've opened channels of negotiation with the chiefs and uh, elders in this oil-producing area. So it's... Isn't that enough? Well, th but this is exactly th what we're talking about off camera, which is that sometimes we're getting different vibes from the different parts of the government. So whereas Sibe Kachuku is talking about, you know, engagement and negotiation and recognizing the fact that force is not the right answer, the president, on the other hand, comes out and says force is the right answer. So we're having that kind of discord in, uh, in terms of what it actu actually is happening within the government. There's a very strong indication that the government entirely are not singing from the same hymn book. So people view mm. the situation from different angles, and that itself could be a major problem. All right, you uh, are talking about discord, and you're talking about um, um, government not being co not communicating properly among themselves. Let's talk about the issue of um, corruption. Now, yesterday, the um, Minister of Information had stated, because the president had promised to release names of the looters, yesterday he had said, of course, the amount that has been looted and recovered so far, we will let the people of Nigeria know but we would not reveal the names for legal reasons. And this morning, um, Guy Bashir, who came out to say that the names would be released. So obviously, there is a miscommunication. But what do you make of this? What are your thoughts? Should we involve, should we engage in naming and shaming the Nigerians reserve the right? And does it go any way in, in helping to fight the corruption battle? Well, you know, whether it does help or doesn't help, the most important thing is transparency. 
mean, the government have got to be transparent in what they are doing. And I had the argument that was put forward by Lai Mohammed yesterday about the legal implications of naming people. But then what it, it, it you know, quite conveniently forgot was we're not talking about accusations here. We're talking about people who have actually refunded money to the government. So when you have taken money from your pocket and given back to the government, that itself it's an admission that the money it's is not abuse. yours. Yes. So there's no issue about libel. You know, nobody's asking you to name Mr. X and say he's a thief or he's a criminal. Just name Mr. X and say he returned $5 billion. <laughs> if, if it's a gift to the nation, that's fine. Let him tell us how, no, where it is. But we need to know who is bringing these monies back. And let me tell you why it is important that we do. Because there are issues of fairness in this fight. There are issues of completeness in this fight. I mean, you know, for instance, some people would say that the government has so far gone after only the opposition yes, people. Yes, and I think that is one issue we will talk about. But first of all, let's go on a quick break. When we return, we'll be looking more at corruption. Welcome back to Hello Nigeria on this Democracy Day special. We have uh, Mr. Duke Puta in the studio with us uh, to help with analysis of Buhari's administration 365 days. Before we went on that break, uh, Mr. Puta, we were talking about corruption. You said something about uh, the perception that the anti-corruption fight seems to be slanted, it seems to be witch hunt. It, the, some people call it witch hunting, say it's one-sided, it's lopsided, and all of that. But the argument on the other side is, look, this were the people in power, and they had access to the Treasury, so it's only fair that we're focusing on them. What's your take on well, all of that? Well, that argument doesn't actually hold, hold water, even though, first of all, let me say that you know, if you are corrupt, and you're chased after, then it doesn't really matter where you belong anyway. Because the most important thing is that you <laughs> are corrupt. corrupt. And that's the key thing. I, I always use an analogy which you know is very dear to my heart. If you're driving down a motorway, let's say in Europe, somewhere like the UK, and you're breaking the speed limit, it doesn't matter how many other people are breaking the speed limit on that road. If the police pull you up, you cannot say, hey, look, mm -hmm. he's going faster, he's going faster. Why me? Is it because I'm black? It doesn't matter. Oh, yes. The fact of the matter is you're going too fast. End of story. So I would go along with going ahead and prosecuting anybody who is seen to be corrupt. But having said that, the argument that you know, uh, the opposition party are being uh, prosecuted mostly because they were in power doesn't hold water because inside APC government today are several former PDP uh, the, uh, members who were yeah. in PDP and in government in PDP and spent money recklessly as well. Nobody's going after them. So we're not going to name them. That we know who they are. Quite a few of them who crossed carpet. Yeah? And so ultimately, if that is the criteria, they too should be investigated. But what I suspect Absolutely. is that what is happening is not so much. The government is not going after corrupt people. That is the main thing. And that is why they need to step up. What they are doing is going after money. The reason that we're seeing all these PDP people is because they found a cash of money that was supposed to be used to fight Boko Haram and they followed that money, and they're following that money all the way, all and, they, and it's leading them everywhere. And of course, it's only going to lead them to PDP members because they were the ones that spent that money. But so we're what, not taking a no. Care we're, of the we're, not, we're not fighting course. corruption. If government wants to fight corruption, if I were there, what I would then do, the next step would be the, the minute I find out that this money for Boko Haram was used to fight election for PDP, my next question would be: Ah, election funding is something that we have to be looking at. Because obviously, if these guys use problem. money to find, to find what did they use for their own, so I'll now go looking, not waiting to find the money, but asking the other side, show me your finances. Let me see where your money came from. It's important. That is proactive and fighting transparency. and transparency. But they're not doing that. And they are deliberately not doing that. I'll give you an example. Yesterday on air, so I can say this here, Professor Sage was asked that question. And somebody actually said to him that, Ruth Miyamichi was indicted by a River State panel, of, uh, and what have you done about that? Mm -hmm. And his answer was that that panel is politically motivated and discredited. And see, that kind of you know, answer tells you immediately that they're not interested in fighting corruption. Because on the one hand, before that, he said, show me the evidence and we'll investigate. 
And then this panel reverse test shows you an evidence. I say, so you're, credit, you're discredited, I'm not going to look at it. So it doesn't make any sense to me at all. So the government is not yet fighting corruption, but hopefully, fingers crossed, they will get there eventually. And that is the only hope we have. But if it stays this way for the next three or four years, then we are in big trouble. Because if the next government comes in, and it is the opposition, if for any reason they, they get back, the they will just go the opposite direction. Wow. So we'll, just start it. we'll love to continue this, but we're running fast out of time. Mm -hmm. We just need to ask this question. The state of our economy. Yes. A lot of people have said that the current government has made it worse than it was before they went into power. What do we have, what do we have to say in return? Well, I don't know about this current government making it worse. I mean, the economy has become worse. And it wouldn't have mattered what government was in place. It would have gotten that bad anyway. The key question is, what is the current government doing to tackle that reversal? And are they doing enough? Uh, no, absolutely not. They're not doing enough. Um, they are not looking at the structures that actually are important. I'll give you, again, one very good example. This government, Nigerian government, gets to spend only 6% of our GDP. And, you know, governments spend money essentially based on uh, what other people have. So you notice if m lots of people have cars, then government needs to build roads. Yeah. So, and if lots of people have cars, but you don't take you know, enough taxes out of them, then you never have enough money to build roads. It doesn't matter what you do. Those sense. are the structures mm. that need to change, and they are not addressing those. What they are doing at the moment is tinkering with things. They're talking about creating 500 jobs. Buhari said he's going to create 500,000 new jobs in teaching. I want to understand how you can create 500,000 new jobs when the X number of million jobs you have at the moment, you cannot pay for. Okay. Like, yeah, if you see what I mean. So, yes, again, yes, so, so it doesn't make any sense at all. It's a fantastic so, statement. So, <laughs> so those, those jobs are actually not real jobs. They're just going to be people put there to make the economy even worse. They're not going to become productive because there's nothing coming in. They need to look at productivity. They need, need to look at, you know, minimum wages to see if it's actually sufficient for people to live on. Okay, sir, we're hoping that we'll be able to have a part two of this conversation. But first of all, we'd like you to tune in to Nigeria Info 99.3 from 9.30. And Wenga and Mr. Duke will be discussing more about this with more opportunity for you mm. to call on. Thank you very much for joining us. See you again tomorrow. Have a fantastic Democracy Day celebration. Yeah, we're shouting out here. To enjoy more of these our Ugonge videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.